Couple more quotes. I love to quote people on democracy. I love to read about what people think about democracy. We've been talking about how to understand democracy, and I gave you this distinction between articulations of democracy that emphasize popular participation, popular democracy, the participation in a meaningful way of the largest number of people possible. And underneath that desire to bring people into democratic processes is this sentiment. This happens to come from a very well-known American theologian, clergyman, Harry Emerson Fosdick, who, this has nothing to do with religion in this case, he just happened to, I think, put it in a very succinct way. Democracy is based upon the conviction that there are extraordinary possibilities in ordinary people. It's very simple. The idea behind the popular conception of democracy is that, in fact, ordinary people are competent to run their own lives. That when you create conditions under which ordinary people can participate, that people will rise to that occasion and find within themselves extraordinary capacities. Reflect on what's going on in Egypt. Ordinary people in the streets finding themselves in extraordinary situations and often rising to the occasion. In Egypt, there's all sorts of interesting things going on. The police have essentially withdrawn. So what do you do when you have a large urban area? Well, people are organizing themselves into neighborhood sort of self-defense councils and policing their own neighborhoods. Ordinary people put in extraordinary conditions. All of a sudden, the police are gone. What do you do? That's the notion behind this conception of democracy. One more point to emphasize about this approach to democracy. Remember we talked about uh, Doug Loomis, the political scientist who said, we can't think of democracy as simply a set of institutions. It's an ideal, it's a process, it's a historical process. This from a contemporary author, Ellen LeConte. She's written a very interesting book, just came out, called Life Rules. And she says, we customarily use democracy as a noun, the name of a thing, in particular the name of a form of government. But like life, the larger process of life, democracy is a verb. It's a process, a ceaselessly dynamic, scrappy, creative, adaptive, and ever-evolving process, which, like any exercise repeated faithfully, makes its practitioners better at it. So, Again, this will be the last time I come back to this distinction between popular and managerial democracy, between a vision of democracy as always aiming at broader participation versus a conception of democracy that says managerial elites will eventually have to make the system work. A vision of democracy that sees democracy as evolving, as an ideal that you keep reaching for through that popular participation versus a conception of democracy that focuses on formal institutions and how they're run. So again, these are positions that are simplified, but they help us organize our own thinking with an emphasis on, on our own thinking. I have given you some of my own concerns and conclusions, but those are mine and you should be developing your own as well. Questions or comments about that before we move on? Okay, what I want to do today is move on to a new question. Question that I think is increasingly important. Let me just mute this for a second. Okay. Earlier in this semester, I said that at some point we would be talking about the relationship between economics and politics. I pointed out that in the modern university, these are two separate disciplines, yes? You want to learn about the economy, you go to the economics department. You want to learn about politics, you go to the government department. They're treated as separate. But there's another tradition, a uh, tradition that often goes under the, the name political economy, which makes it clear that these two enterprises are related, that you cannot talk about the nature of a political system without talking about the nature of an economic system. 
that you cannot talk about the distribution of power, which is what we are discussing in the realm of politics, yes? Politics is about that distribution of power. That it makes no sense to talk about the distribution of power without talking about the distribution of wealth. That the distribution of wealth will affect the distribution of power. Okay? Let me give you a, an easy example of, of how that might work. In the United States, we have a system of free, fair, open, contested elections, correct? Our elections, there, there are occasionally abuses, but for the most part, our elections in the United States are free, fair, open, and contested. Anybody can run, and they are held in a fairly transparent manner. We have freedom of speech, correct? Relatively well-developed guarantees of freedom of speech. Again, not perfect, and there are abuses at times, but a fairly well-developed system of freedom of speech and freedom of association, political association. That is to say, in the United States, you can pretty much say what you want to say about politics. You can pretty much organize yourself into any kind of political group that you want to, and you can run for office, correct? Anybody want to contest that claim? I think that's pretty, you know, you can get pretty good consensus on that. Now again, lots of questions, but that's a pretty safe statement. All right. So let's take two people, just two random people. Let's take, well, we can use me as an example. And then, oh, just for grins, we talked about Facebook. How about Mark Zuckerberg? Yes, you know who Mark Zuckerberg is? He's a young man. He's about half my age, and he's worth about a billion times more money than I am. <laughs> Mark Zucker is a very rich man, yes? Mark Zuckerberg, excuse me. Mark, you know Mark Zuckerberg is sort of is the founder of Facebook. I was about to say the inventor of Facebook, but of course, a lot of dispute about that. Uh, okay, so Mark Zuckerberg and I, let's review the facts. Uh, does Mark Zuckerberg have freedom of speech? Can he speak about politics? Do I have freedom of speech? Can I speak about Tal? Yeah. Uh, anything Mark Zuckerberg can say, I can say too, correct? He doesn't have any special freedom of speech above mine, does he? No. Uh, freedom of association. If I want to start a political party, can I do that? If Mark Zuckerberg wants to start a political party, can he do that? Okay. Uh, elections. How many votes does Mark Zuckerberg get when he goes into the voting booth? One. How many votes do I get? One. Okay. If Mark Zuckerberg wants to run for office, can he do that? Can I do that? Okay. So, Mark Zuckerberg and me. Right? We have the same claim on the freedoms that we're discussing that are central to a democracy, correct? Therefore, Mark Zuckerberg and I have approximately the same ability to affect the political process, correct? What? Who said no? What's Mark Zuckerberg got that I don't got? Influence, influence because of? Money. So it's not influence because he's a, a better looking guy or more charismatic. Couldn't be that, right? Are you saying, wait, 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 now I have to step back. Now I'm confused again. You people are confusing me a lot today. Are you saying Mark Zuckerberg has greater potential to influence the political process than I do? And that that ability is rooted in money? Are you suggesting that, sure, I have free speech, he has free speech, but he can take some of those bazillions of dollars and buy more speech than I can buy? He can, you know, take out ads, he can buy TV time, he can monopolize the airwaves with all those bazillions? Is that what you're saying? Are you saying that, sure, freedom of association, but he can use that money to hire organizers, to bring people in, to buy people off. He can hire lobbyists to affect the people who are eventually elected. Are you saying that the fact that Mark Zuckerberg has money gives him more clout in the political arena? Well, that's destroying my conception of democracy because remember, economics, politics, distribution of wealth, distribution of power, democracy is about some sort of notion of equality in the political process, yes? I mean, underneath the notion of democracy is the idea that we all have roughly the same place in the system. That's the nature of a democratic system, correct? But now you're telling me that 
an individual who has accumulated wealth in the economic arena might be able to influence the political arena in a disproportionate fashion. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Well, if you're not telling me that, then you're clueless, because it's pretty obvious, yes? That, in fact, you cannot speak of the distribution of power, politics, separate from the distribution of wealth. To try and speak of them separately is to deny reality. I mean, who in their right mind thinks the distribution of wealth doesn't affect the distribution of power? How many of you who are of modest means right, believe that you have the same clout in the political world as Bill Gates? No, no, okay. Now, you might be better looking, more charismatic, smarter than Bill Gates, but we know that Bill Gates has money, and that money affects the political system. So, we're asking a very simple question here. Does democracy depend on capitalism, or does capitalism undermine democracy? Okay. That's the question. Does democracy depend on capitalism, that is, is a democratic political system going to be fostered by a capitalist economy? Is capitalism going to be an asset in our quest for democracy? Or does capitalism undermine democracy? Is capitalism an impediment to democracy? That's the question we have to deal with. There's a section in the Dahl book where he talks about this, and Dahl concludes, and I would conclude as well, that it's not a yes or no, either or question. It's a complicated question. Today, in class, what I want to do is run through some of the data that I think is especially important to trying to answer that question. Like most of what we take up in this class, I don't think there are simple answers to these questions. Okay? but we have to wrestle with them. And often what I'm going to do is present information that goes against the grain, that challenges the conventional wisdom on this, because the conventional wisdom, sort of by definition, is readily available to you. You've heard it in your educational life, heard it in school, you hear it in the media, you hear it in all sorts of channels. So what we're going to do today is look at this question. Does democracy depend on capitalism, or does capitalism undermine democracy? We're going to look at that with a particular focus on how the, the latter of those two claims might make sense. Okay? We're going to do that first by looking at some data. Right? Facts matter. If you want to ask questions about the relationship between an economy and a political system, you have to deal with some data. So let's start with some of the data.